Hello and welcome to February's first installment of Really Old News, the most esteemed archaeology news series on YouTube. The discoveries made around the world that were announced this week are both particularly grisly and astoundingly grandiose, so let's dive right into them. Human vertebrae threaded onto reed posts dating to the 16th century have recently been found in the Chincha Valley of Peru, located around 200 kilometers south of Lima. This was the location of the aptly named Chincha Kingdom, which existed from around 1000 AD to 1400 AD before eventually being absorbed by their allies, the Inca. These rather eerie vertebrae on posts were discovered by an international research team and were recently published in the journal Antiquity. 192 different vertebrae on posts have been discovered so far, and they were found in and they were found in and around a local type of large, elaborately built grave meant for multiple individuals. The scholars who published these vertebrae on posts argue for placing the deaths of the individuals whose spines wound up on them to around 1520 to 1550, and the creation of the posts to around 1550 to 1590. During this time, the Chincha population, now being ruled by the Spanish, experienced marked decline as a result of epidemics and famine. The Spanish also extensively plundered indigenous graves in the Chincha Valley around this time, both in order to extract the silver and gold in them and to erase indigenous religious customs, which led to a lot of the Chincha's mummified ancestors being destroyed. But the discovery of these vertebrae on posts likely reveals that the Chincha highly valued the bodily integrity of their dead, like the ancient Egyptians, and that the looting conducted by the Spanish had corrupted them in some way. As such, threading their spines onto posts was a way of restoring the potency of their formerly corrupted dead. Six of these vertebrae on posts are in perfect anatomical order. 30 are in partial order, and 27 just aren't in anatomical order at all. But the spines on each of the posts do appear to correspond with single individuals. Some other Andean cultures are known to have highly valued the bodily integrity of their dead. The Chinchoro culture, for example, thousands of years older than the Chincha and located around a thousand kilometers south of them, maintained the rigidity of their mummified dead by threading a wooden stick into their vertebrae through their spinal canals. Like with the Chincha vertebrae on posts, the vertebrae in the Chinchoro mummies weren't always in perfect anatomical order, indicating that their external appearance trumped them being put together correctly. The Inca also believed bodily integrity after death was important, evidenced by them deliberately sacrificing young children through non-bloody sacrificial techniques like drowning, strangulation, and burying them alive, because they believed that nothing incomplete should be offered to the sun. And the last Inca emperor, Atahualpa, converted to Christianity in order to avoid being burnt at the stake, which didn't mean that he wasn't killed. Alternatively, however, the vertebrae on posts may have just facilitated the transportation of the remains of individuals who had died away from their communities, and they also may have been trophies, symbols of status and power, representations of certain individuals, or uh, things that would have been displayed as part of ceremonies. I personally think that the first theory I went over seems more plausible, and it's what the authors of the research paper proposed, but who knows. Oddly enough, based on the analysis of teeth samples from two crania found within a cholpa, the people these vertebrae on posts belong to were non-locals from the North Peruvian coast, so maybe this has something to do with the social differences between locals and outsiders in the Chincha Valley at the time. Alternatively, non-local people could have also brought the vertebrae on posts with them to the Chincha Valley. Who knows? Before we move on to our next story, remember to like and subscribe if you want to see me make more content just like this. In other news, a truly staggering 18,000 inscribed pottery sherds, also known as Ostraca, have been discovered at the site of the ancient Egyptian city of Athribist. The enormous amount of these Ostraca is only comparable to the huge quantities found at the famous ancient village of Deir el-Medina, home to the people who built the tombs in the Valley of the Kings. A temple of Minre and Repit at the site, begun by Ptolemy XII, father of Cleopatra, and last added to 
by the Roman Emperor Hadrian was also being built around this time. Athribus was also the site of a thriving pottery industry from the early Ptolemaic period all the way to the late 4th century, indicating how all the recently discovered pottery ostraca came to be. 80% of these ostraca are in Demotic, a, an Egyptian script loosely derived from hieroglyphs, and the second most common language found on these ostraca is Greek. However, ostraca inscribed in Hieratic, Coptic, and even Arabic have also been discovered. A number of these inscribed ostraca came from a school, and they include lists of months, numbers, arithmetic problems, grammar exercises, and and writing exercises that were probably punishments in the same vein as modern grade school punishments and the opening of The Simpsons, because the school's pupils were forced to write the same one or two words over and over again on the shirt's front and back. In addition, an alphabet where each letter was represented by a depiction of a bird whose name began with a particular letter has also been discovered, although I don't know which exact language it's in. If you've ever wondered if any of the homework you've done over the years will be gawked at as important artifacts in the far future, this discovery certainly indicates that it's possible. Ostrica. These inscribed ostraca also include lists of names and accounting documents, which seem... There are also fascinating pictorial ostraca bearing art, including depictions of animals, local gods, regular people, and geometric designs. All these ostraca were recovered during excavations led by Professor Christian Leitz of the Institute for Ancient Near Eastern Studies at the University of Tübingen, and Mohammed Abdel Badia and his team from the Egyptian Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities. This international team is set to analyze and interpret these ostraca, but even though I'm sure they have all the best intentions, I don't think these ostraca are going to be published anytime soon, especially considering how many there are. Moving on, 40 decapitated skeletons have been discovered in a Roman cemetery in South England, near Fleet Marston, itself near Aylesbury in Buckinghamshire, during excavations preceding construction of the HS2 high-speed railway. These headless skeletons were found in a late Roman cemetery holding 425 bodies, with 40, a little less than 10% of them, having been decapitated. Their heads were placed next to their feet or between their legs. One theory explaining this entails that they must have been criminals or outcasts of some kind, but this burial practice is actually well known elsewhere from the Empire and was probably a normal but not too popular Roman burial rite. I wonder why. Most of the graves in the cemetery were inhumations, but some were of cinerary urns. Two distinct burial sites within the cemetery suggest it was organized according to tribe or ethnic grouping. The discovery of the... The discovery of the remnants of a small but busy Roman town nearby is also pretty interesting. Fleet Marston is a medieval town, but its Romano-British past was known prior to this discovery through the discovery of Roman pottery and coins here and there. But recent discoveries made over the course of a year by the HS2's archaeological program have completely blown those discoveries out of the water. Some of the town's domestic commercial... Some of the ancient town's domestic, commercial, and industrial buildings have been unearthed in addition to the well-made limestone surface of the important Roman road and adjacent drainage di ditches that ran through it. This major road has been dubbed Aikman Street, and it connected Verulamium, which became St. Albans, with Corinium Dovinorum which became Sir, Sir and Sester. I, I don't know how to pronounce that. <laughs> uh, Aikman Street was also intersected by several smaller roads at ancient Fleet Marston. The location and density of pottery and coin finds in Fleet Marston suggest it was a market town and or an administrative center. In fact, parts of the widened road may have been used as a market with space for carts and stalls. Due to its position on Aikman Street, it was probably also an important way station for travelers and soldiers traveling along it. Over 1,200 coins, my personal favorite type of Roman artifact, were unearthed. Additionally, objects including weights, spoons, pins, brooches, gambling dice, and bells have been uncovered at this ancient site. Settlement development and the number of burials indicate the town grew in size in the mid to late Roman period, possibly because of increased agricultural production. But there's actually evidence of what was going on in the area prior to that. 
Early in the Roman period, the area was the site of open-cast gravel quarrying, possibly used for the construction of the aforementioned Aikman Street and the streets that branched off it. Also, an even older, large Iron Age enclosure featuring long, wide ditches was found near this site, along with an Iron Age coin found at the site itself. The largest cachette of ancient Egyptian embalming materials ever found has just been discovered by Egyptologists from the Czech Institute of Egyptian Science at the western edge of the important ancient necropolis of Abu Sir, just 15 miles south of Cairo. Excavations have been going on here for three decades. The cache was discovered intact within an enormous 45 foot or 14 meter, 16 by 16 square foot or 5.3 meter by 5.3 square meter shaft and consists of more than 370 large pots arranged into a spiral pattern circling the walls of the shaft in 14 different clusters. The number of vessels stored in each cluster varied from 7 to 52. These pots contain the remains of materials that were used during someone's mummification. Amongst the top layer of large pots were canopic jars with inscriptions revealing that they belonged to a man, likely a high official, named Wahibre Mary Neith. I'm guessing his name is a reference to the 26th dynasty pharaoh Apries, whose prenomen was Wahibre. Some elites of the period bearing the name Wahibre Marineth are known, but it's not known who among them is the Wahibre mentioned here. In addition, the canopic jars also identify Wahibre Marineth's mother, the Lady Irturu, but not his father, oddly enough. The embalming cache has also been dated to the 26th dynasty by the cache's discoverers, and they specifically date it to the 6th century, which was towards the dynasty's end. The burial of materials involved with the mummification of a person was a deliberate throwback to earlier Egyptian traditions. Because 26th dynasty Egyptians liked looking back to the good old days. After all, they had just endured being ruled by all sorts of foreigners, Assyrians, Kushites, and Libyans for centuries. High officials living for a 50-year chunk of time between the late 26th dynasty and the subsequent First Persian period, which I recently did a video on, have been found at this location previously. There's a large shaft right next to the one that's just been discovered that's believed to be Wahibre's actual tomb, and its excavation is planned for later this year. Ancient arms and armor have just been found at the site of the ancient city of Velia, originally known as Hayil, in Campania, southwest Italy. These include two superb, intact bronze helmets and numerous weapon fragments, including those belonging to a shield. They were discovered under the Temple of Athena at the site in layers predating its establishment by at least 50 years, and contemporary with the city's founding around 538 to 535 BC, in a, rect in a rectangular 18 by 7 meter structure with remains of votive offerings, including painted ceramics and inscribed vases. The arms and armor were themselves likely votive offerings, votive offerings and were probably seized from their Etruscan foes at the Battle of Alalia. One helmet is a Nagao type Etruscan helmet with its characteristic Vitulonic shape, and another is a Chalcidian helmet. You see, the Greek Phocaeans who established Hyel were survivors of a Pyrrhic naval battle that took place off Corsica sometime between 541 and 535 BC, when 60 Greek ships faced off against 120 Etruscan and Punic ships. The Phocaeans technically won this battle, but they still had to flee Corsica and their previous colony of Alalia. The objects discovered here are going to be cleaned and further examined, and hopefully the interiors of them will and hopefully the interiors of the helmets just discovered will bear inscriptions as, as they often do. Last but certainly not least, a truly magnificent 50 square meter or 540 square foot 6th century Byzantine mosaic has just been unearthed at the site of Germanicia Caesarea at modern Kahraman Maras in southeast Turkey. It depicts an outdoor feast and is jam-packed with beautiful imagery. Three ladies dancing with Kotala, ancient castanets, two adorable couples cuddling, a guy with a 
pan flute, two men in front of a lavishly set table making presentations, a boy happily climbing a fig tree, and a guy on all fours painting or drinking from a crater. Whoever made this was so skilled that they even got the glass vessels on the table to appear almost translucent. This mosaic is likely a pre-hunt banquet or party accompanying accompanying a hunting mosaic found back in 2015. The site of Germanicia Caesarea itself was first discovered rather recently in 2007, when the authorities found out about illegal excavations conducted under someone's house here. As of late, around 100 villas containing astounding mosaics have been located here, all dating to late antiquity. The mosaics that have been found here are notable and rather unusual for bearing pagan motifs in a time when the Roman Empire was Christian. But the area was devastated by the Arab-Byzantine Wars relatively soon after the creation of this mosaic, and it was lost to the ravages of time. Digs will continue when archaeologists are hoping to fully excavate the villa that encompasses the party mosaic. They also plan to open the site to the public at the end of the year as an archaeological park, so hopefully you'll be able to see this magnificent mosaic in person in due time. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Really Old News, and make sure to like and subscribe if you want me if you want me to put out more of these more of these uh more of these archaeolo more of these archaeo more of these archaeology news series. Goodbye.